Hello, everyone. We are back for our last session of the day. And I'd like to encourage you all to please take your seats. <clears throat> Thanks very much, everyone. Please take your seats so we could get going. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to our online community. For those of you who are just joining us for this session and you haven't yet asked a question, please know you could do so on Twitter by asking your question and using hashtag Chow, C-H-O-W, 2016. That's hashtag Chow 2016. Thanks very much. We look forward to hearing from you. So uh, to kick off this session, I'd like to take this opportunity, um, given the focus of the discussion, to show the full video from our sponsor, NOAA, about the 40th anniversary of the Magnuson-Stevens Act that extended U.S. waters to 200 miles that provided a framework of science-based fisheries management that also established eight regional management councils and promoted and enforced accountability in our nation's fisheries. You saw a snippet of it, a little teaser earlier today, but now we'll show the whole video. Thank you. Our ocean fisheries provide many benefits, food, employment, fun, and a place to connect with nature. Thanks to the Magnuson-Stevens Act, we will continue to enjoy these benefits today and into the future. Since 1976, the Magnuson-Stevens Act has been the primary law governing marine fisheries in U.S. federal waters. It created a system of regional fishery management councils that allows government to work with fishermen and partners to sustainably manage our nation's fisheries which includes more than 470 marine fish stocks and stock complexes. The Magnuson-Stevens Act works to prevent overfishing and rebuild overfished stocks, increase long-term economic and social benefits, provide for abundant recreational opportunities, and ensure a safe and sustainable seafood supply. In the four decades following World War II, the annual world fishing catch quadrupled due to technological improvements and fishing vessels that could travel the world's oceans. By the early 1970s, it became apparent that such development was not limitless. Foreign fleets were scouring our waters, and fish stocks were collapsing. Fisheries such as Northeast Atlantic herring and Alaskan salmon were in serious trouble. In the 40 years since the passage of the Magnuson-Stevens Act, a lot has changed. We have ended chronic overfishing, rebuilt 39 fish stocks, and put our fisheries on solid, sustainable footing. Our nation's commercial and recreational fisheries now contribute more than $100 billion annually to the U.S. economy and support 1.8 million jobs. The Act's focus on science-based decision-making has challenged us to find answers to real-world questions about how to responsibly manage our living marine resources. During the past several decades, we made significant scientific advances, including new statistical methods for assessing data-poor stocks and remote sensing technologies to collect data on fish that were, until recently, beyond the reach of our science. Today, U.S. fisheries are globally recognized as responsibly managed under a transparent process based on science, responsive management, enforced standards, and full stakeholder participation. We have learned that there is no end point to sustainable fisheries, but it is a journey of continuous collaboration, monitoring, and adaptation in an ever-changing ocean environment. On behalf of NOAA Fisheries, Thank you to all fishermen and stakeholders who participate in the management of our nation's fisheries. You know, these um, video clips have been um, really uh, interesting, fun, and educational part of 
uh, this symposium for me. So I just want to say thank you to the staff at the foundation and to all the sponsors for prevent, uh, presenting them and, and providing them for us today. So our final session today discusses how government, fisheries, fisher people, um, private industry and other stakeholders are working together to continue to advance science-based fisheries management and guide the wide use of electronic monitoring and advanced technologies for monitoring our nation's fisheries. And so now I'm happy to turn um, over this discussion to uh, a friend and a mentor on these issues, Kate Wing of Kate Wing Consulting or KW Consulting. Um, who's been looking at integrating data collected through new technologies like electronic monitoring, reporting systems for fisheries managers, and exploring lessons in data monitorization and other fields from, uh, to help improve state, regional, and federal fisheries information systems. Thank you, Kate. And to the rest of the panel, we we'll look forward to hearing from you. Hi, Sam. Thanks, Don. Well, thank you all for coming to our panel today on using these new technologies, sometimes referred to as EM, electronic monitoring, or ER, electronic reporting. We will try to avoid the acronymization of this field today, but feel free to wave your hand and shake it all about if we slip into acronyms you do not understand. So electronic monitoring, electronic reporting, these are terms that we use to describe the wide range of technologies that we're using here in the United States to better understand, monitor, and track our fisheries. Many of these programs are being done in cooperation with fishermen, and in some cases, fishermen themselves are innovating and designing the technologies. And so the panel today is going to talk and bring a bunch of different perspectives into how we can use these new technologies, some of which you're seeing on the screen here today, actual hardware, software, outputs from these systems. How can we link these systems together so that they give us the data and information we need to manage our fisheries better into the future? How can fishermen, conservationists, scientists, and other folks play a role in and improving these new hands-on ways of bringing fisheries to better future outcomes, both for the fish populations themselves and for all of us who rely upon them and appreciate them. So I'm very excited to have such a distinguished set of panelists with me here today, in particular, Mr. Sam Rauch, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator for Regulatory Programs. I always have to look that up because you have a lot of words in your title. Um, you also have both a JD and a master's degree because you are an overachiever for the fish, and we're all appreciative of that. <laughs> Sam has been at NOAA for more than 10 years working on fisheries issues, including in a variety of different roles. He has a lot of expertise both on NOAA's regional and national man management systems, and in implementing the Magnuson-Stevens Act at all different levels, from the on-the-ground regulations to the in providing of information in reporting to Congress as it needs in order to ensure that Magnuson is being fully implemented. Our next guest is Nancy Monroe. She's the founder and president of Saltwater Incorporated, which is one of the leading providers of observer coverage in the US. That includes both human observers and electronic observers. She also sits on the North Pacific Council's Electronic Monitoring Working Group, and so she has expertise both in the design, development, and deployment of technology, as well as in the development of the policy that's needed to make sure that those technologies are actually serving goals. Our next guest is Brad Pettinger. He is the director of the Oregon Trawl Commission, which is an industry-funded state commodity commission that covers the shrimp and groundfish trawl fisheries on the West Coast. He has fished, he, le he has leased his boat, he has spent time on the water and on the slippery decks of boats in the Pacific Northwest, and he's very proud of having helped get MSC certification for the limited entry groundfish trawl fleet on the West Coast. And our last guest here is Chris McGuire. He works with TNC. He's the Massachusetts Marine Program Director. He leads their electronic monitoring program project with the New England groundfish fishery. And he, has, he too has spent a lot of time on the water, both in the Sea Education Association program and because you also can drive a 1,600-ton U.S. Coast Guard certified vessel. You have a full master's license. So between our panelists, we have a lot of experience on boats, thinking about boats, wiring boats, legislating boats, and otherwise on all possible aspects of implementing a full and complete data system to track what our fisheries are doing today. So we're going to explain that all for you, and then we're going to take your questions and figure out how to make that all better, right? Right. Excellent. So let's start from what you're seeing from your perspective right now. Chris, can you give us a sense of what you see 
from the perspective of the New England groundfish fisheries, what's going on, what are the needs, and what are the challenges in implementing electronic monitoring and reporting? Yeah, so uh, one of the focuses of the Nature Conservancy's work is really on using technology to improve the information on which management decisions are made. So that's kind of a fundamental thing. We're working on projects like electronic monitoring and electronic reporting across the globe, whether it's in Indonesia, we're heavily invested in the West Coast groundfish fishery and also um, the programs that I'm uh, leading in New England and the New England groundfish fishery. Um, and what we find in New England, New England is a really, um, you know, it's a really broad cross section. The New England groundfish fishery has a lot of different things. There's big boats and little boats. There's near shore and offshore. There's big ports and little ports. Um, and so as we think about how to design uh, a monitoring program that includes electronic technologies, it's not one size fits all. And so what we're focused on this year, and we began um, what the um, National Marine Fisheries Service calls an exempted fishing permit, which is a way of sort of trialing new things through a regulatory process. We began uh, an exempted fishing permit to use uh, electronic monitoring in the New England groundfish fishery um, eight days ago on June 1st. So we got a lot of experience. Um, but but we're, um, so we're working with mostly uh, sort of small and medium-sized vessels. The average vessel size in the New England groundfish fishery is less than 50 feet. So these are, there's a lot of small boats, and we're working mostly in the sort of small and medium-sized boats. So it could totally fit in this room. Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, although it, getting it in here would be hard. Um, uh, so, um, you know, and what we're doing is we're working to really put this on the ground for the first time in New England where it's uh, not a pilot, and in my definition, a pilot is something where you are experimenting with a new technology while also following the existing rules. Um, what we're doing is sort of early implementation where we have about a dozen fishing vessels equipped with camera systems, and they are using the information collected by those systems uh, in lieu of at-sea monitors who are mostly charged with quota accounting, and in addition to um, the biological monitors who do things that are very difficult for cameras, like collect ear bones. Uh, that, that's hard for a camera to do. Um, so that's sort of like where we are in New England. We're just getting things off the ground. Um, there are a lot of different approaches, and we're testing a few of them. Brad, what's your perspective from the West Coast? What are you seeing going on? Well, I think that uh, you have a, a catch here program on the West Coast, and it's, a, it's IFQ, and so everybody's accountable for each and every pound of fish they have. So uh, we have 100% observer coverage mandated for each vessel. Um, with that, uh, accountability comes sort of a certain cost. And so having an ob onboard observer on every boat um, could be expensive and uh, also could be very hard to get that observer in some ports, but specifically the uh, smaller, more rural, let's say rural ports, so like Fort Bragg, California is maybe four hours from a major uh, airport. For instance, it might cost a thousand dollars to get an observer to that port to go fishing. So uh, EM is a great way to um, maintain accountability while cutting cost, and I think that's uh, it's really crucial that, uh, as an option. It's not good for necessarily every fishery or every region. I think um, if you look at the West Coast, um, um, I think we have a hundred thousand pounds of uh, uh, halibut mortality associated with, for the entire uh, West Coast uh, trawl fishery as an IBQ, individual quota, uh, bycatch quota, and so. Um, if you, I know right now, as we're going through this um, uh, EFP for, um, for the uh, bottom trawl fleet, um, if you catch a halibut, 100% of the mortality is associated with that fish. Um, if you have an onboard observer right now, it's 20% of mortality if it's in good shape. So if you're li uh, fishing north of 4010, uh, it's pretty hard to use a camera, and uh, at least at this point in time. I think it's exciting for down the road is what we're seeing some of the uh, technological aspects where I think that uh, we're getting close where we can actually um, uh, incorporate uh, viability into the system uh, down the road, but we're not quite there yet. But I think that uh, it's a great way to cut cost and uh, uh, give access to a lot of these uh, smaller ports and a lot of, actually a lot of these smaller vessels that uh, can't afford an onboard observer. Nancy, you've been on a lot of these boats, particularly working with the tuna fishery on, in the Atlantic. What are you seeing as the needs and the challenges in terms of moving to a more electronic way of counting and tracking fish? 
Um, on the East Coast, um, NOAA Fisheries, um, through their Highly Migratory Species Division and concern over bluefin tuna bycatch, um, instituted an electric mo electronic monitoring program for the entire Atlantic Pelagic Longline Fleet. The rule was passed last year, first of the year, and NOAA Fisheries contacted uh, Saltwater Inc. to provide, integrate, install, develop, and maintain the systems for it's about 100 plus boats that fish in this fleet. And it's from the Canadian border down the East Coast around Florida into Texas, and then some in the Caribbean. Um, as Brad mentioned, it is not only difficult to get observers to Fort Bragg, but our responsibility now for these vessels, they cannot fish without an operational EM system. So that's our job now that they're all on the boats. But I would contrast that with um, a program we're also working, so that's very large scale. It's the largest EM, EM implementation to date in the U.S. And um, I would contrast that with another program that we're working on in Alaska, and I think these kind of give you a feeling of what's happening with EM in the U.S. overall. This is a very small program. It was instituted by fishermen in Alaska's Pacific pot cod fishery. And what they felt, they wanted EM for their fishery as opposed to observers, and they, um, but they weren't getting any, let me say that the political attention was all on Alaska's longline fleet at the time, so they weren't kind of getting anywhere. And um, they went to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation and got funding for a very small pilot project, like four or five boats. And um, we've been working with them for several years now, and I'm thrilled to say that the North Pacific Fishery Management Council just voted in February to put them on track for implementation. So that's two programs, two different coasts. One was inspired by this concern for bluefin tuna bycatch and was it really instigated and inspired by NOAA fisheries. And the other that's really come from fishermen themselves wanting electronic monitoring and was funded by National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So that's kind of a contrast of the scale of what we're seeing. Sam, do you want to give us your perspective from high atop the Silver Spring Fisheries <laughs> Tower? <laughs> Silver Springs Metro Center, right. Um, so nationally, I think it is, um, these are great examples of how we're moving out. Uh, let me just step back a little bit and talk about monitoring first before we talk about electron monitoring. We've been monitoring fisheries for decades. Currently, last year in 2015, we monitored over 78,000 sea days, 900 human observers that we put on boats to monitor, catch, bycatch, a number of kind of, to collect those ear bones, right? So we, we have for a long time monitored fisheries, and we have some of the most robust monitoring systems anywhere in the world. Um, but those are expensive. It is expensive to put a human on a boat. It's sometimes it's dangerous. Um, that there are these logistic issues about getting the, the, the human observers. They're great when they're there, but they can be expensive to maintain. Currently, we have a number of sy systems where um, there's a lot of interest, both in the fishermen and the community, to increase monitoring requirements. We have to figure out how to do that in a cost-effective way. There are only really two ways to pay for increased monitoring requirements. Either the industry will pay for it or the taxpayer will pay for it. In either case, we're interested in trying to, to do that at the most cost-effective way possible. Cameras can do that for certain kind of camera systems. So we are very interested in using cameras to either supplement existing human uh, observers, or in the proper case, maybe replace some of them. We will never replace all of them. We need to have, you know, that workforce there. But um, maybe we could replace some of the uh, the human observers at a lower cost. So we've been investing both time, energy, and resources from the federal perspective in these systems. We have to recognize that it's a partnership. There are both technological and regulatory issues. The technological side, we've talked about some of those things. It's not just about seeing the fish just have to deal with things like who, how long are you, who's going to keep the data? How are you going to catch a video file that is collected offshore, onshore in some warehouse? How long are you going to keep it? Who's going to keep it? Those kind of questions. And all those questions have costs associated with them. They're all completely solvable. There's not, there's not a technological issue that we, I, I've seen, or I think any of these people have seen, that is not solvable at some cost. The question is, is that cost worth, worth it? Once you get the technological issues done, you also have to look at the regulatory issues. Right now, some of these programs are voluntary. Some of them are mandatory. 
Um, the Atlantic HMS one is a mandatory one, which has come out there. Some of them are, are, are more voluntary. In, in, when we're looking at observer requirements, we have to work with the fishery management councils and states, our other partners, to try to determine whether this is a voluntary option, which we're giving them to just choose the lowest cost alternative, or whether this is something so significant that we want to actually mandate it. And to do that, we have to work through the council process. So we've been going through that. We were able to do this as a regulatory regime in the Atlantic, in the Atlantic fishery that we talked about here. The uh, Pacific Fishery Management Council just passed. They're, they're transitioning away from this experimental permit to a more permanent regulatory structure. They just passed that regulation in the last few weeks. Uh, we're still working on Atlantic. We're still working in the Northeast. Uh, we're still working on, sorry, the North, the North Pacific. Uh, we're working in the Northeast. There's a number of them coming online. We currently have about 300 boats in uh, with cameras on them right now. That number is just going to continue to grow. So I thank you all, and thank you all for that perspective from what, you know, where you are on the water and, and near the water, what you're seeing happen. But I think there's a really interesting question here as we move towards electronic tools and electronic monitoring. It's, and it's interesting to see, I mean, when you think about it, the iPhone really only appeared 10 years ago. And now how many of you have an iPhone or an iPhone-like device in your pocket, right? So in a decade, from a technology standpoint, we can really transform from something that was unimaginable to something that is so everyday that we take it for granted. And on fisheries, while it might be too much to hope that a sector that doesn't perhaps have the same consumer market as an iPhone, that we would see technological change quite that quickly. We can, of course, take advantage of some of those technological changes. And for the folks who were here for the IUU panel, the Illegal, Unregulated, and Unreported Fishing panel this morning, there was a lot of talk about the power of technology to see what hasn't been able to be seen before and to count what hasn't been able to be counted. And so here within the U.S. on this, thing about sort of within the U.S. on this panel, a place that is seen as being such a leader in fisheries management, in part because of our ability to hold our fisheries accountable to catch limits. There is this opportunity to use technology not only to improve our catch accounting and our catch tracking and our catch science, but also potentially to build a new form of management that has more trust to it, has more of a co-management partnership. Because it's one thing to try and trust people when all they're doing is writing down on pieces of paper that they submit six months later, and that maybe somebody has time to scan a year after that, and you really hope you didn't miss anything. because. While we would hope that's something that only happens not in the U.S., unfortunately, that does sometimes happen in some of our record keeping in the U.S. It's still paper-based and sometimes still you know, not being entered on a timely manner. But when we move to an electronic system, we can verify where you are. We can see what you've been doing. We can, in fact, surveil your every waking moment as a fisherman. <laughs> and that could be creepy. <laughs> or that could bring us to a place where we now trust you to an extent that we weren't comfortable trusting you before because all we had was this watered piece of paper with illegible handwriting on it. So can you talk a little bit about this move towards technology and trust as a way of really having fishermen as partners in management in a way that they have been moving towards but maybe not been able to achieve with the methods we have today? I mean, I'd say just briefly, I think that the trust thing is really important. I work in the New England groundfish fishery, and we, there's really no, not much trust uh, between any parties there right now. It's pretty contentious. You know, the fishery was declared a disaster a few years ago. You know, they are struggling with choke stocks, with contentious science, with, um, you know, pretty much everything. It's, a, it's sort of a scramble right now. Uh, and one of the things that we see as a huge opportunity is exactly that, to shift that trust balance a little bit. One way of using electronic monitoring is to uh, use what's called an audit approach, where fishermen report, in, the case, in this case really we're focused on discards because um, the accounting of the kept catch is done really well by, you know, onshore by the dealer. That's where the money changes hands and everybody watches that. Right, so the fisherman wants to make sure they're getting paid. The buyer makes, wants to make sure they're not overpaying. Right, so that's pretty well, uh, pretty well watched. Um, but we're talking about discards, and one of the things you get with an audit system is maybe at some point you have a camera running all the time. Fishermen report their discards, and then some of that video gets watched at a random interval. 
uh, to make sure that what the fisherman reports is actually verified by the camera. You know, it's trust but verify, as Ronald Reagan might say. And that's the system that's been used in British Columbia's groundfish fishery for many years, right? Ex exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I think that that you know that it really flips the trust uh, equation around a lot, uh, sort of from where we are now, where a lot of the time data reported by fishermen is seen you know, in science circles sometimes as being sort of anecdotal because it can't really be backed up. Uh, at least that's the perception of, of, uh, of fishermen. And so trying to get past that, and um, that's one of the reasons why a lot of fishermen are interested in this. It's like, look, I've got the video to back me up. You know, what I say is not anecdotal. Here, you know, here it is right there on the video. And the other thing is, you know, when you're using that type of an approach, um, you know, you need to figure out how much you audit uh, in order to make sure you have a good result. And that's something that we are working on really in close collaboration with our uh, partners at um, the National Marine Fisheries in the region to think about how, you know, what is the percentage of audit that is sort of statistically defensible and makes sense to ensure you've got that uh, compliance, but also keep your costs down for video review. Well, I, I think that if you look at the uh, West Coast uh, groundfish fishery, um, we pit bought them around the year 2000. And um, shortly afterwards, I think the observers started to come on to, into play. We got a much better handle on removals uh, from the ocean. And I think there's probably no fishery maybe in maybe the country or world that probably knows more about, that, that more is known about than the, the trawl fishery. We have observers for a number of years. We have um, a, a AI or VMS units on the vessels for well over 10. I and, vessel monitoring system. I'm sorry, <laughs> another acronym. I, we live in acronym hell, okay? <laughs> um, but if, I think really for the most part of the last 15 years, the removals are known. I think when you know the removals, that's the key to rebuilding stocks. And I think that uh, the, I think the, uh, having a, 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 a good understanding of what's come out of the water is really crucial. And I think when you have a catch-year program where you have individual you know, fishing quotas people own, um, there's an ownership and a stewardship uh, level or a, is uh, probably much higher than maybe some other fisheries. And that people are thinking long-term because if you're buying quota, you're buying it for long-term. It's not cheap. And I think there's, um, uh, that's an important component. Uh, I would like to point out, or just I mentioned it earlier, that uh, just hats off to the agency. Um, the, the Whiting Fleet in the West Coast, as uh, Sam mentioned, was just recently uh, moved forward to put a regulation in 2017. Um, hats off to them for um, having the resources there to put it in place. Uh, and, um, and also, that's going to be the first uh, council uh, deemed into regulation in the, uh, um, yeah, I think, for the most part. So it's uh, uh, industry, I think, for the most part. Um, is there's, there's a real value in it. Sam, you want to jump? Yeah, in? so I, I want to respond to two other things you said. One is, I think when you're designing these programs, you, you have to figure out how much you really wanted to survey this, right? We don't, there's no desire to survey the fisheries 100% of the time. I don't need to know what is going on in the fishing boats unless they're actually fishing. One of the things that is going on in the Atlantic fishery we talked about, those cameras turn on when the nets are deployed. They're triggered to turn on them. That is what we're concerned about. We're not sitting there trying to monitor fishermen behavior. The, at other times, whatever else they might do on the boat, that, I mean, that's part of the, our trust that we build with the fishermen is that we, we're there to monitor for a reason because we actually want to know what that catch is. But we don't, we're not sitting there trying to monitor everything that goes on that fishery. We're not trying to be big brother. We're just trying to watch the fish. And so you can design systems that are not on all the time, but that are on all sort of automatically when the fish comes in and not. That's a cost factor. The other thing that you mentioned though, about trust, I believe that the U.S. fisheries already get a premium. They get access to certain markets that other countries can't give because we have already a robust monitoring system, mm -hmm. because people trust that monitoring system. If people stop trusting, and if other countries stop trusting that monitoring system, I believe many of our fishermen will not have the same privileges and access rights in other countries that they have now. So that's not true with every fishery in the United States, but many of our fisheries do get that kind of premium. And from the federal perspective, we want to keep encouraging that. We want people to be able to trust in the fishery, to trust in the data. These electronic systems are a way to add to that, but I don't want to, to leave the impression that we don't have that already. We already are getting that with our human observers. They provide that same level of trust. This allows us to even increase that. Could I just jump in on one of Sam, Sam's comments, just to echo it. When we initially put the systems on the pelagic longline boats, it's exactly what he says. They were triggered. The cameras went on. They were triggered by the hydraulics. And to be quite honest about it, the fishermen kind of complained because it's a longline boat. 
and it's you the hydraulics are triggered when the line goes out there's no fish and then they're triggered again when the line comes back in so we came up with a way to adapt our system so that we are only recording when the line comes in we did this because fishermen complained they felt it was an invasion of pro privacy but as sam po co very correctly points out it also saved a lot of money because there's that much less data that needs to be weighted through so i think some of these fixes um, are ones that are going to be instigated sometimes by the agency sometimes by the fishermen themselves but there has to be that match together and just t tagging off brad your comment I think as we look towards fishermen's, um, one of the things that's happened on the West Coast, which is very exciting in the use of technology, is now that we have this and we have the quota shares, there's a, a motivation for fishermen. They want to make the best possible use of their bycatch, which is basically constraining their target catch. So they have formed cooperatives, and it's very sophisticated. They're reporting in to a, a basically it's a co co-op system, but it's a, quite apart from the government system. But what they have on board, it, let's say I'm going around and I hit a toe of canary rockfish, which is a very constraining species. It's a disaster, and it's a disaster for me because I've used up all my bycatch for the whole year, and it's a disaster for everyone else. I have to go to Brad and see if I can buy some more canary rockfish, and he says, well, I don't know. Anyway, we're all in the same boat. So what they have done is they have combined their forces. It's all being put into a computer program. So I, as a fisherman, now know, oh, God, Chris was just over there fishing last week, and he got X, and it shows up as a bycatch hotspot. And this is the kind of technology that I think as we think about EM in general, you know, figuring out how it's going to benefit not only our management of the fisheries, but how it's going to benefit the fishermen themselves. So that's just my perspective. I have another question for you, Nancy, as really one of the innovators in the field of developing this type of technology. I mean, Saltwater was one of the first firms to really be able to produce and, and install this. What do you see as some of the moves that the councils or the regulators of the agency could make to make the field more open to other firms who might want to enter the market? Now, I realize you might be planning to have a monopoly and corner the entire <laughs> electronic <laughs> market market, but if you, if you were looking to help other technologists, other developers enter the field, what suggestions would you make for how to improve the bar to reduce the barriers to entry for new technologists wanting to get involved in electronic monitoring and reporting? I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> it's one of my favorite subjects. Um, one of the things that we believe very strongly in at Saltwater is um, open source software and open specifications. By open specifications, what I mean is that the formats of the data being collected on board, the encryption, the way the encryption is being done, Typically, what has happened historically with electronic monitoring is providers like Saltwater um, have its proprietary software for the data acquisition software on board. Well, it just so happens that that proprietary software can only be read by that same provider's review software. So you're locked in. Oftentimes, as a consumer, whether you're a fisherman or a government agency, you don't really get that right off until you go, oh, shoot, gosh, I wanted to expand that to more, but, you know, I have to go with the same old system because, you know, I'm kind of stuck, right? So um, Saltwater, philosophically, we believe from the beginning that there should be open source review software. And again, quite frankly, it, was nationally, it was, uh, became a national policy by National Marine Fisheries Service. And we had developed a basic data review platform, and national, um, the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation funded us last year to expand that open source review software. And our thinking on that is basically, you know, to put it in a nutshell, that we don't think we're going to have every great idea in the world. There's lots of very bright people out there who are working on things like auto lengthening, species automated species ID, you know, Kate always has the idea of a fish hackathon and what we could accomplish in a weekend with a bunch of bright people. Well, you have to have a basic system to put that on. So the deal with open source software is basic, it's based on open source code, which means that anyone can use it. Anyone can use it to look at, to study, to distribute. 
the only criteria is if they develop something that is added to that code, that also goes into the public sphere. sphere. Well, the corollary to that, and the reason why we did that is not only because we didn't think we'd have every great idea in the world, but we thought it would lead to the long-term cost effectiveness of EM. The corollary to that is having open specifications. This open source software has been designed to be very adaptable to all kinds of different marine fisheries. It's built on a template method, so you can put in the different species codes or whatever you need. But it's also been built so it can be adaptable to different onboard data acquisition programs. But as long as those remain proprietary and there aren't open specifications, right now there are no standards for EM data formats. So open standards will be very controversial, but open specifications should not be, in our view. So anyway, that's what I think could be one of the um, most significant things. If fishery managers or consumers, whether it's fishermen or fishery managers, said, okay, I'm going to buy your system, but I want to know what the specs are, that would solve the problem. Uh, well, and if we required open source code for some of these review things, we could avoid a situation just in case there was like a Volkswagen trying to put their thumb on the scale because anyone could review the code, right? Right. Yeah. Not that that would <laughs> ever <thought> happen, <laughs> ever. <laughs> so, so we have a question from the audience about the something sort of about duplicative monitoring and, and, and who is covering the cost of monitoring? Are we, are we duplicating paper systems with electronic systems? Are they additive? And also sort of does that end up duplicating effort or cost? And, and so I think one of the things we could talk about that, if it, at, at its simplest level in general, there's not an effort to both put cameras on boats at the same time as you have an observer unless you're actually running an experiment to try and calibrate something. And you're not doing an electronic logbook or an electronic fish ticket and, an elect and a paper t fish ticket and a paper logbook at the same time. It's either or. So there's not a, it's not a situation where people are necessarily running those two systems at the same time unless you really are trying to run an experiment to see does one change behavior or collect different data in a different way. But this issue of, of ginning up new technologies and approaches without revisiting your underlying goals, I think is where we get into this question of, are we potentially introducing new duplication or new data generation without it being tied to a clear goal? So every fishery management plan has a component that says, what data do you need to prosecute this fishery? Give us a list of the data. And then the NOAA Fishery Sciences Centers take note of that, but being scientists, they also have other ideas about data that might need to be generated and collected in the world. And then there's other data generated by public universities and things that ends up being fed into how you design your fishery management program and set your catch limits and things like that. As we develop things like video monitoring systems or integrated electronic reporting systems where maybe your VMS is tied to your digital logbook, so the, the vessel location tracking system immediately plugs in your location to a logbook that automatically records what you just caught, that automatically ships everything out. Are we potentially generating more data than we actually need? Or are we generating data in duplicative ways because all this electronic data is now giving us all this metadata that's on the back of the images, that's on the back of the video, that's, that means we don't have to keep collecting it in other ways. Do we need all of these systems all at once, or do we need to go back to what data do we really need to achieve our fisheries goals and compare that with these new monitoring methods and say, okay, are we in alignment or are we just kind of Christmas treeing this out now that we have these cool gadgets and drones and, and gugas? Do you think that that kind of reconciliation between what are our data goals and objectives and what are our tools is, is happening so that we're, we're getting what we need in an effective way? I think we might be getting Maybe to a certain extent, but, but I think we're getting far better information, and I think it's probably way more cost effective. I think the logbooks, for instance, when you write down a paper logbook, it's got to be translated by somebody else and the data has to be entered. I don't know how many times I've seen um, where people with, where the logbooks have shown that canary rockfish have been caught out in 500 fathoms and they don't live outside 100 fathoms. Um, I said, I think what you're getting is far more accurate, which is probably even though you might be getting more stuff than you may potentially need, uh, but I don't think there's anything there that would violate any, um, any um, 
uh, private, you know, privacy concerns, something like that. I mean, but uh, I think it, I, what we're really seeing is there's, if it's done right, there's, the cost effectiveness thing is far better, and, and accuracy is there for people to take advantage of. Whether they do it or not is up to them. But I think that that, uh, that is just the, the we're, we're gaining is just, just such an increase from what we've had in the past, in my mind. Jump in on that, Chris. Well, I mean, I would just say that I know that um, for the people using, the data users on the back end, that there is actually a lot of value in data redundancy because you can connect different data streams in that way. So, you know, if you're using position as a pretty easy tool that's coming down from a satellite, doesn't require a lot of interpretation, you know, if you have an electronic mm -hmm. monitoring file that is position stamped and then you have a trip report that is position stamped, makes it a little easier to, to meet those two and not have um, orphan data uh, streams, and that is something that happens a lot in the paper world right now, which can be really challenging for um, for the stock assessment scientists and for managers to really reconcile exactly what's going on. So there's some of that, but then I think the other thing is that um, I know um, uh, that the National Marine Fisheries Service has started to really look at the data system uh, holistically in a lot of regions, and we think that that is a really important uh, step to take because like you say, we're generating a lot of new information. Maybe there are some things we don't need to do anymore. Uh, a lot of the, the back end system is that uh, how National Marine Fisheries Service, how NIMPS handles the data. If that can be really efficient, um, it floats all boats. It's, easy, it's better for fishermen, it's better for scientists, it's better for managers, but that is a Herculean task. I mean, it's a huge volume of data coming in from all these different streams. Um, and I know that that's something that the agency, at least in the Northeast and I think in other regions, is really focused on how do, how do they, you know, make that as efficient as possible. And so I think in that process that there may be opportunities to say like, and we might not need this one anymore. But until you really like lay it all out on the table, I think it's going to be hard to, um, hard to make that determination. So if I could add to that, I, I do think one of the things that you started with is very important, which is you have to figure out what data you need and why you need it. We, we want to avoid this being a technology in search of a problem. Mm -hmm. And so we have a problem, and this is the most cost-effective way to solve it. That's the mindset that we all want to have. It's important. All these monitoring requirements are set through the council process to begin with. That's why we have the human observers. It was not necessarily because the government said we're going to do it or because we could catch all this data. It was because the council said this is a cost that should be borne. And we agreed. And so the same is true here. We have to sit out there and say, for each piece of this piece of data, is, is this a cost? And is it going to be borne by the taxpayer or the industry? Either way, it's a cost. Is it something that's worthwhile? Do we need it before we do? Now we figure out whether we can collect it. Because there's different ways to, to construe all these electronic systems or even to go back to paper systems. But you first have to decide whether you want it and need it. I will say that the process you talked about in New England is going on in some fashion everywhere. Our science centers every year take a big aspect of their program and they'll do a review and they'll ask questions like, do we need to continue to do the survey? Is this data collection stream still important? They do that with external peer reviewers and they give us critiques and we work with the state partners to try to, it, it costs money to do all these things. Is it worth it? Are we still using it? And we will change those things. So that's part of the iterative process. But we always need to keep that in mind, that we don't collect data just to collect it. There has to be a need. Then we're looking for the most cost-efficient way to meet that need. And this is, in many ways, potentially that. It could, could be. So since you were just talking to him, I'm going to point a, ask a question back to you, because you're kind of already on a roll. And, and I'd like to ask you a, a lawyer question, okay. which is, oh that when you're moving into a world where you're just specifying sort of data fields and regulation, you have to collect fish length, you have to collect right. fish size, you have to collect fish species, that's a relatively set of, uh, simple set of instructions that you can give to a state or a regional fishery information network system to make a form. When you get into electronic monitoring and reporting, the specifications and the regulations can get more complex your very able and trusty staff, including your legal staff, now have to make judgments about frame rates and flash drives and a lot of technology components that, that may be something they haven't spent a lot of time working with. Now, this issue of 
modernizing data and adopting new data technologies is something that agencies across the federal government are dealing with now. How do you write regulations? How do you procure services and evaluate and test new technologies? You know, Veterans Affairs, healthcare, all of those agencies are trying to figure this out. What types of tools are you giving your staff to help them come up to speed in thinking about writing clearly what the expectations should be for these new technologies in regulations and, and, and what else could folks do to help if you're looking for resources to help bring those staff who know the law very well but may not have spent a lot of time getting to know how to write about digital technology? There's a lot of things in that question. Yes. <laughs> so let, let me start by um, first talking about uh, performance standards because that essentially what you describe is one way to regulate by sitting there and telling the industry we want a we want this data we want to know how many fish you discarded and you have to give us this data with these quality parameters and that's all we're going to we'll audit it but it is a completely third party system and that's a performance standards that's approach. a performance standard system embedded in that is a lot of trust i mean that's a that's a we will audit after the fact we won't run it so you you need to have a fairly mature industry willing to be able to do that. We have some. Um, and you have to be able to you know, understand that it's not completely 100% within the government's control. So there's, there's some risk there. But you know, that is a system that is more cost effective. Many industries run that way. I think we would like to go that way. We're looking to, uh, to do things. I think the Pacific structure that we just, uh, that the council just approved is very similar to that or has principles in that. Um, so that's one model. The other model is a more command and control structure where it's basically uh, the government buys the cameras, the government owns the, the data systems. A lot more trust in that system, but a lot more cost. And so that's what we debate. And I think we, we can't afford too many of those command and control systems. So we have to invest in these kind of um, trust but verify, let the industry do it, and we'll audit it systems. That creates a set of problems, particularly if you're going to use it for enforcement. So if you're going to use it for enforcement, you have to figure out, well, now what is the chain of evidence of that or that? Or if you're not going to use it for enforcement, it's a lot easier. So all these issues we have to work out. How we do that is a part, second part of your question. We have been working. We have a staff. We have an uh, a electronic monitoring coordinator. You know, we work with each of these councils. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the lessons that the Pacific just learned and share it with New England, share it with the we've, we, we've had cameras in some fashion in Alaska for a long time. Share those. Take the Atlantic HMS or the Atlantic Highly Migratory uh, system that we just implemented and share those. Each one of these are a little bit different, but these issues of data storage, of uh, performance standards, setting the regulations, they're there. Um, so we, we are trying to train ourselves and our councils through that process. There is some uh, funds that Congress has provided for electronic monitoring that we use both in terms of external grants, some of it, and some of it in terms of staff development on the councils to help get these kind of things through. So we understand it's an issue. You know, we're basically running eight different experiments or even more around the country with the different councils, and we're trying to coordinate those as, as, as much as we can because the issues are similar, if not a, but not identical. We have a question from the audience about how fisheries data are used for other science, how, how much these new data streams might be shared for other scientific purposes. So I'll expand that to include the entire bucket of what we would call fisheries dependent data. NOAA does independent research on, a lot of independent research on the ocean that are picked up with and collaborated with by scientists all the time. And for those of you who haven't seen the latest public data releases that NOAA has done, they did a big set of data releases of publicly generated government research in, starting in March. They rolled that out as part of the new White House efforts on transparency. So fishery independent data, the independent trawl surveys that NOAA does, those are quite publicly accessible and lots of people use them for other science purposes. But fisheries dependent data, in part because of these privacy and confidentiality concerns, does have some more constraints on it. So can you talk a little bit about how these new technologies might enable fisheries dependent data to be better used in other, to answer other scientific questions or to be integrated into other ocean and fisheries research outside of just monitoring catch and sort of meeting fishery management plan requirements? I can answer both. 
like to give other people an opportunity. <laughs> sure. Um, it's just useful for fisheries? Well, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunity. The confidentiality rules are put in place on purpose to protect fishermen's uh, private business data. And I think that that's something that fishermen are really concerned about. You know, I think that the big brother aspect of having video data out there is something that is generally concerning to fishermen. And so I think that they feel pretty good about the existing confidentiality rules because I think that they do a good job of sort of protecting that data. You know, that being said, I know that as more information is collected electronically, um, it opens up a lot of sort of vessel of opportunity uh, science projects. Whether or not you would necessarily be sharing a video stream, uh, I don't think that's really the thing that you're looking for as much, but now you have a vessel's track recorded. It would be pretty easy because you have an electronic system to have you know, bottom temperature sensors on fishing gear that are uploaded automatically to have, collect weather data to do oceanographic uh, monitoring. I mean, I think as you become more, as fishermen and fishing vessels become more facile with the transmission of electronic data, um, there are a lot of oceanographers who are really looking at that as a great opportunity. Um, so I think it's less the actual video and more the using electronic, using and gathering electronic information opens up a lot of possibilities. And there are, there are a number of great projects that are going on right now doing exactly that, and I think there will be more and more. I mean, we, you know, there is a huge data gap. We heard Senator Whitehouse talk about this yesterday. There's a huge data gap on collecting ocean information, and fishing vessels are out there, and they're a great, um, a great vessel of opportunity for that sort of thing. But I want to push back on that a little bit because you, do you think fishermen need to think about confidentiality differently in a world where I can go on marinetraffic.com and watch your AIS trails anytime I want or <laughs> buy a live satellite photo of, that shows what's going on on your deck? I mean, I can see if you're smoking or not on the deck of your boat now on some of those high resolution satellite photos. So at is your fishing location really that private? I mean, the, in the IUU conversation this morning, the representative from Bumblebee spoke about the fact that they just do a built-in time delay of 30 days or 90 days to their data. So that's how they mm -hmm. prevent it from immediately revealing the hot fishing spot then. And so some of the data could just have a built-in sort of obscurity fuzzings piece by not releasing where you fished for three days or even seven days because the currents change so rapidly. So is it a time when this concern about confidentiality is something that fishermen should maybe re be revisiting in the interest of better trust and more accurate, rapid data reporting? Here, let a fisherman answer that. <laughs> well, 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 I think what you're talking about is on a voluntary basis, people may want to step forward and maybe volunteer to do a program, be involved as a vessel opportunity for somebody. Um, I can see that people are doing that. Um, but I do see there is you know, confidentiality, confidentiality issues here that maybe come up to some folks. Some people are far more right. um, sticklers about that than others. Um, my brother and I just put a radar in the boat last week. It'll track 100 targets simultaneously and track all of them. And you go, so the, there's no, in the fleet, there is no secret spots anymore. Just, right. just an FYI, right. there's no secret spots. Okay, <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's that big of a, de of a deal, but I think that as a uh, you know, as a, uh, boats get better and better uh, equipment on their uh, the vessels, um, I say temperature at depth is something that I think is something that really unknown for most parts of the water outside of these buoys we have uh, positioned. I think it's a tremendous ability um, in the future to get. That information, which might very well help uh, inform us about uh, you know the environmental concerns, and I think that the, the really there's no limit to what can be done. Um, but I think it's what you're asking, what you're talking about is probably more on a voluntary basis because it's not a catch accounting issue. And so I think, but uh, but the fishermen I think see value in a uh, knowing more about what's going on in the water because ultimately they can make good, sound financial decisions uh, into the future. And I think just to add one small point is that I think to some extent what we find is that there is a little bit, and I'm going to paint with a really broad brush here, but there's a little bit of a generational divide in some of these things where, you know, people who, like the young new fishermen coming into the business, they're used to like sharing their stuff on Facebook. And I mean, they're like, they grew up in a sort of a sharing world. And I think a lot of the 
uh, fishermen who've been at this a really long time grew up like holding the cards really close to their chest and really much more private. And so I think that you know you're beginning to see that move um, happen to some extent through um, through demographics. Are you on Instagram, Brad? Are you, are you Instagramming you in those? Houses? I don't do Facebook either. No. No. If I maybe I could add a little bit to this, I think that um, what electronic monitoring really adds is the ability to do things in real time that you couldn't do before. And the ability, and you could vastly replicate the numbers because it is expensive to have the human observers, but you could have a, an awful lot more uh, observations. So you're going to get the same kind of things that you got with the cameras, but you're going to get it quicker, and you're going to get a lot more of it, which means the data bars are going to go a lot less. <laughs> I don't think the confidentiality issue is really an issue that much in the fishery because the government gets all the data, so we can see it in individual vessels, but if we can get more than three vessels together, we will release it in aggregate so that all the scientists will know. They may not know where Brad fished, but they will know that it, some fishermen fished there and caught this issue. So all that kind of data in some aggregate form, which is mostly useful, we, it, is, it is the kind of data they want. You, know, you won't get the vessel-specific data for the public. We'll get that, um, but it's out there. But that's the same right now with our human observers. You get the same level of data with that now. But the real, the real advantage that you get is more real time, so you can better track it with what, even if you don't have the sensors on the boat, you can track it with you know, what you know right now about the weather conditions or the oceanological conditions. And you get a huge potential increase in the number of samples that you get. And that's going to mean you've got better accounting for what went overboard. All your information will get better. Um, that will have benefits because you can manage much more sustainably once you know all those things. This is big data coming right. to fisheries in a way that it you know, has changed a lot of our lives in a lot of other things, and it's, it is ripe to come into fisheries. And that's, you know, to make big data happen, you've got to collect a lot of it. And that's where we're at right now. That's just like we're at the threshold of going to big data in fisheries. Well, I. I might have a difference of opinion on you on exactly what a chilling effect that confidentiality rule has on some of those releases of data. I mean, the rule of three means that you can't, uh, you can't know the identity of a person or a business. So that means if only three boats loyally in Fort Bragg that day, Noah might decide not to release that information because I might be able to figure out which one of those fishermen are, which is a real example that people have tried to get some of these data forward. And uh, there's also the Catch Share Indicators Project, which was a partnership developed in part with Noah and uh, MRAG and other folks looking at trying to create a suite of biological indicators across the New England and the West Coast, and they ran into some real challenges getting a hold of some of those data in part because of concerns about confidentiality and the ability to aggregate even at a large scale across a fishery. So it, whether the actual la letter of the confidentiality provisions is holding up data or whether it's people's fears of what, how they're reading it, I think, again, this gets back to this culture of do we gain more by being more open and sharing our data and letting our data talk to each other and be reconciled even within an agency, much less more publicly, than we lose by sharing that information? Do we gain more by being more open in a time when this could get us more accurate, more real time, faster data? So I'm not going to ask the employee of a congressionally mandated agency to comment on language in the uh, congressional statute unless you're planning on retiring really soon. But um, I just wanted to add that editorial comment from the moderator's perspective. So we have a question here about the commercial value of data to the fleet and wholesale buyers. Is there a burden? that they, I'm assuming they mean the, the fleet and the wholesale buyers should bear, not just because it lowers, lowers regulatory costs, but because it provides the fleet and buyers with data to help them make better business decisions. So should, what, what is an appropriate amount of cost for the fleet and the businesses to bear? And then beyond that, should that be tied a little bit to the benefit that you're getting out of the system? And I just want to flag that this is a complex question in some ways because many of the buyers have already built duplicate systems that fishermen are running because they have to fill out electronic systems for Bumblebee or Sea to Table or a lot of the major buyers because they want them to do electronic forms and then the government is still requiring them to fill out paper. So at this point in time, yes, businesses are getting a a benefit from the private systems that they have built, but the public systems don't plug into it yet. 
So part of the question is, what do you think is an appropriate cost share to bear? And should that cost share reflect the ability of the public system and whatever private business systems you need to be able to talk to each other rather than a fisherman having to enter data three times depending on who they sold it to and what fish ticket or logbook requirement that state has. <laughs> well, right now, I mean, yeah. we're paying 5% vessel buyback fee and 3% cost recovery fee. And if you have an observer on board, it's $500 a day fee um, and any association fees you may have. So I think the fleet's paying, they're already paying for the most part. Uh, we also have VMS fees we pay, right? So um, just from an industry's perspective, um, I'm satisfied that we, we don't go any higher. <laughs> like to pay less. Right. Uh, I mean, is there some way that incorporated? I, I, I think the states, you know, like Oregon has gone to an um, uh, electronic fish ticket. Um, we've been trying to push the electronic uh, uh, logbook through the council. We haven't. I, we we will have that with the uh, with the um, um, with the EM program uh, for next year. Um, I think that all those systems save money. I think there should be everybody. If it's done right, you should be saving money. So I think by going to that route, there's already a value to whoever's doing it because they're saving money on it. I don't know why. I'm not sure what your question is as far as who should pay extra for that when there's already an efficiency gained. So. The, in, the determination of who should pay is, um, in reality, one that Congress makes, at least for the federal fishery, a certain number of Congress appropriates the budget. We get a certain number of uh, funds for Congress for human observers and for monitoring. And so if monitoring is, if people want increase in monitoring, and that's not in the budget, then the only choice there is the industry will pay. And for some of those systems, we want to have that. And that's a complicated case-by-case uh, -case fishery determination. Um, but in many instances, the industry is getting an additional benefit from uh, just the electronic logbook. I think Brad mentioned, or somebody mentioned, that you know, it, part of this is we're setting up private markets for a quota. So if you come in and you you come and you uh, need extra uh, fix X and you don't have the quota for it, you can call up somebody to do that. Well, there needs to be some confidence that that person has that quarter hasn't taken it. The observers, the monitors provide that kind of confidence. It, it helps that industry so that they can continue to make a profit. Um, the, you know, there are other kind of observers out there that are, are there to look for endangered species. You can have a debate about who should pay for what, but it, it, there's still only two sources of those funds in, in each year. That's a discussion we have, it's a discussion we have with the council. I think the trend is, more and more for as these monitoring requirements continue to increase to have the industry pick up more and more of the cost. You see that in Alaska for a long time. The Pacific's now done that. The Northeast has now done that. The more the, th that is the trend because the budget is not increasing, right? Unless you vastly increase the federal budget, you're going to have to do that if you want more monitoring. And that's, and that's what we see. And, and it, you know, the industry, they're not happy about it, but it is another cost of doing business. If, the, if it is reasonable, that's usually we can make that happen. Yeah. I, I think there's also economy of scale here, too. I mean, the, the system we've created in the, in the uh, Pacific Northwest is something that can be replicated elsewhere. And so, like, the startup cost, in essence, can be right. are, are, they're incurred once, for the most part, the architecture of how this thing works, and they, it can be exported to other areas. So there's a, I think everybody gains in the long term and wants to go that route, so those costs should be lower. Um, as more people come online, uh, companies, that's all the yeah, competition, that's all good stuff. As technology gets better, hopefully those costs will come down. Um, so. And I think that gets back to the conversation we were having earlier about open source, open specifications, and performance-based regulations, right? If, if you set a performance-based regulation and there's open source code out there about how to make your own logbook that meets NOAA's performance standard, then Chris could stay up late one night and just get his Python on and like write a logbook that with one touch, right, once you have a US Coast Guard license, I assume you can also <laughs> write Python. So that, and just go hand in hand, right? So that you could stay up all night, make your own logbook, 
and make a logbook that included all the fields that you wanted for whoever your buyer is, whoever your processor is, whatever you care about for your business, and what your state and your NOAA requirements are. And then you, all of that information, you push one button, it goes to all the right people, and instead of having to fill out three different forms, there is a real efficiency to your time to taking an open source piece that meets a performance standard and building a tool that gets you one-stop reporting. Now, is it NOAA's job to build you a one-stop reporting tool or the state's job to build you a one-stop reporting tool? Probably not. But it's NOAA laying the framework to make it easier or harder for you to innovate in a way that reduces your efficiencies. That's a question that the agency has to consider moving forward. And I think in the Northeast, um, all the fishermen we're working with are in this electronic monitoring program are reporting electronically uh, through their, there's a federally uh, mandated form, the electronic vessel trip report, which is fish tickets in the West Coast. So, you know, you're reporting your, your catch and your discards. And those are done electronically and there are standards uh, and one of the um, electronic monitoring providers that we're working with has developed their own electronic logbook application specifically because it dovetails with the electronic monitoring um, hardware and software so that fishermen only have to enter things once. And it all cross-pollinates um, across, you know, across the two platforms. At the end of the day, there are two data streams that come out, one of them fulfills the existing requirement for a vessel trip report, and the other one is providing catch information from, uh, from the video review at the end of the day. But from the fisherman's perspective, they are doing those at the same time. One other thing that I think is embedded in your earlier question, there's a fisherman who we work with who is a real champion for electronic monitoring. And one of the things he is always talks about but hasn't really figured out yet is, what is the benefit to fishermen of having this technology? Like, is there a market benefit? Is there a traceability benefit? Is there a you know, MSC certification benefit? How can I get paid more for my fish because I've got this accountable system and this camera? And that's, I mean, I think that's in there and we haven't cracked that yet. Um, and I don't think really anybody else has either, but it's a good question to keep asking like, what more can you get? And particularly for businesses who are paying for this thing, it's like, well, if I got to pay for this thing, what more can I get out of that? Uh, you know, are fishermen using the information that's collected to go back and, you know, and evaluate their fishing practices so that they could be more effective on their next trip? I mean, is, how, how can they make the most use of this system, which they're sort of required to have, uh, but, you know, like, can it help them even more? And so I think that is a real frontier that, um, that honestly we're not really working on yet, but we probably should be. And there's a lot of fishermen who are interested in that. Nancy's probably already figured that out. Completely. <laughs> yeah. um, no, I think, Chris, you're absolutely right. That's a huge point for fishermen, and it's very practical. It just makes sense. For example, in the pot cod fishery, you know, the fishermen have already come to us and said, you know, it'd be really good for us if we had a record of, you know, and it gets back to salinity, temperature, of where we really got the full pots. And that's the kind of way that I see this information really helping fishermen. And as you point out, it'd be two data streams. There's going to be one. one. But, you know, um, I don't want to make this world sound all that everyone's also agreeable, <laughs> at least. From some of the fishermen that we deal with, actually, one of their concerns with filling out a logbook, whether it's paper or e-log, is that they feel rightly or wrongly, that if they make mistakes in it, it's one more enforceable action. So I think there is, one of the things that I think every EM study in the world that I've read has ever said is fishermen really have to get behind the system. And um, I think this is a real concern. One of the issues that's ha going on right now in Alaska is um, the enforcement side is saying, hey, we really need VMS. And the fishermen are going, ooh, you know, and actually, as many of you who have dealt with electronic monitoring know, some of that you could get from electronic monitoring systems, some of the data that would be going from VMS. So there is some duplications. We don't have all these things figured out yet. And I think there is some, um, there's the whole range of reaction from fishermen, from my experience, from the very enthusiastic kind of, they love it, and they, they are beginning to see, ooh, that could be good, to, um, uh, fishermen who are very concerned whether it's about privacy um, or 
you know, gosh, I really have to be careful now. So I think there's the whole, the whole range that, are, that is going on. Well, and we, we don't have a representative here on this panel talking for the recreational fishing sector, but that is another place where you're seeing electronic reporting tools, self-reporting tools, and other monitoring tools come into play, right. and NOAA having to figure out how it wants to integrate those into its historical data collection system. So some of what commercial fisheries are struggling with now, but what's the, what's the trust, who's willing to share what, where is the value add in adding this electronic record keeping is also coming up in the, in the recreational fishing sector too. Yes. Which I will not make any of the commercial fishing representatives try and comment on just to flag for those of you who are interested in these things, those apps are out there and you should talk to some of the recreational people in this room of, who are here and I could point to them if you want to ask more questions about. Maybe I can say just a little bit about that. I mean, recreational fishing is, is an important aspect of fishing in this country in places it rivals or exceeds the economic value in terms of jobs and fishing removal yes. from the commercials. And so there's two kinds of the recreational fishermen. There are the businesses that run charter fisheries operations, and they are much more amenable because they're a business, so they can, they can deal with reporting requirements, and we've seen a lot of electronic logbooks to get better real-time data from them. And then there's the private anglers, and I don't see that we're ever going to put, be even asking to put cameras on private boats like that. But um, more real-time data, that is the real advantage of that. You see a lot of the cell phone technology that you started with talking about with the recreational fishermen where they can, using their phone in real time, put in what they caught that day mm -hmm. and figure out how to that, use that into the stock assessment is one of the new areas that we've been exploring to try to get better data out of that fishery. And then you could verify that with whatever Instagram pictures of themselves they posted at the same time. Uh -huh. I don't know that we're going to be doing that. <laughs> Just one other thing on that, which I think is um, worth mentioning, is you know we're focused on sort of electronic monitoring in a regulatory uh, environment right here. There are a number, I, I, there's a number of uh, fishermen who are beginning to collect data that is privately held by them uh, with groups for different reasons. Um, like one good example is happening in the Northeast where there are a group of commercial, uh, like charter party fishermen who have all the guys on their, uh, you know, in their group are collecting spatial and catch information that they are keeping as private information largely related to um, uh, offshore development. And they want to be able to say when the next, you know, mining company or whatever is going to be working in their area, they want to have a record of where they fish uh, and, and what their footprint is because they see that as something that is a threat to their business. And so they're interested in figuring out how they can collect information on their own, uh, which would look sort of like what it would be if it was required, but it's not, you know, in that case, it's voluntary and there's a different driver which I think it's really interesting to see how, because the technology is so easy, I mean, they do it on their phones, mm -hmm. you don't need any widgets, um, but, they're, but they're doing it for a completely different purpose. So there's a lot going on in the electronic space. Right, and that's one place where fisheries has a lot, of com a lot in common with a lot of these other places where you're getting the rise of big data, right? You pointed out a case in which fishermen are collecting privately, holding the data privately, and deciding when to share it. And it could be that if electronic monitoring systems are wholly privately owned, per the hardware is purchased by the fishermen, the software is owned by the fishermen, then NIMS only gets permission to have access to some of that data as part of their license. But the fisherman owns the data, and then they can sell it to a big data mining company or to Hollywood who wants video of fish coming over a deck or to whoever they want. But they own their data much like you could own your own healthcare data or you could own your own video data from your own private art project or what you do on public lands. And so th there are a lot of larger questions about what we, who owns their data if it's collected in a public place or on a public resource or in this sort of mixed public-private space, a private boat on a public ocean, that NOAA is bravely sailing its way into navigating, uh, as are the fishermen, and, and how much they want to share and how much they want to bring forward. So I think that sets us up well for that question I, I, I primed you all that I was excited to ask, which is, what is your future of fisheries and ocean management with EM in it? What are you seeing as the bright and brilliant future that you want to see five years from now as these technologies become more robust. What's it going to look like for you, your fishermen, the people you work with in the future? I'll bite. Um, you know, I think, I think we've talked about a lot of the tools that are out there. And like you said, the, 
there aren't that many insurmountable issues. It's just a matter of putting it all together. I mean, I think the future looks like you know, high accountability that is easy for fishermen to use and that is really inexpensive because of the changes in technology. I mean, I think everybody that I talk to about electronic monitoring instantly jumps to like face recognition, fish recognition software. Like that's what everybody wants to talk about. Uh, and it's totally gonna happen. And it seems, yeah, exactly. It's, it, you know, it seems like it is a yeah, doable, sure. it's doable. It uh, it hasn't happened really at a scale yet, but you know, if you can begin to, the, the, we haven't talked too much about costs, but the biggest cost of an electronic monitoring program on an annual basis for the, is video review. Uh, and, the, and it's really subject to, um, to how you design your program. So the more video you watch, the more costs. The less video you watch, or the more efficiently you watch that video, um, the, less, the lower the cost can be. So one thing that, uh, that often happens with you know, a computer-aided thing is you don't really get rid of the video reviewer, the person, but they become super efficient. You know, the computer's really good at telling when there's nothing happening. Uh, and then it just can just put the reviewer right on the, where they need to work, and they can uh, review a huge amount of catch information really quickly, and that can really change the cost equation. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, five, six, seven hundred dollars a day for a human observer. You know, I think that the costs of electronic monitoring now, because like you said, that we're not at scale, mm -hmm. they're still pretty high. They're, I think they're less than that, but uh, we've, uh, we've been doing this in New England all of eight days, so uh, it's a little early to say. Um, but, but I think they're less than that, and with technology, we could see the bottom fall out of that price in a big way. And so I think that really changes the dialogue uh, when cost is not the issue. When you're really just looking at, you know, how do we have good accountability, how we're using this information across the, you know, across the fishery. I think that, uh, I don't know if we're getting to say better, at least for our fleet. I think we're pretty well, I mean, uh, pretty well monitored. I think the costs are going to go down, as, as you mentioned there. Uh, but I think on the, beyond monitoring, I think there's some really advantage market-wise, especially for our fleet, because the trawl fleet, we deal with volume to a certain extent. And I think that it's uh, basically, basically the commodity market. And I remember um, I was in uh, London like six, seven, eight years ago, and, Walking through one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, supermarkets there, they had some blueberries for sale, and the blueberry had the name of the farmer and, and the county it was it was uh, it was grown in, and it kind of it decommoditized the commodity and it more personalized it. And I think that in the future you're probably going to see um, where that fish is caught at, the name of the vessel, the skipper, and I think that uh, and, and basically kind of put um, they say de decommoditizing a commodity, bring it more personal to folks. And I think that's a uh, tremendous uh, uh, potential uh, going in the future, outside of the cost going down, because that's always an issue, while maintaining accountability. I don't have anything revolutionary to add to that, although I would say a couple of things. One is I think Sam touched on this at the very beginning, and I think it's absolutely critical, is as you're designing these systems, I think being pragmatic the question that Kate said she was going to ask us is, what's the ideal EM system? And I would say you've designed it from a pragmatic standpoint. And that's not just on the data collection. Yes, do I think the cost of cameras is going down? Yes, I do. Um, I think there will be large advances in the software. I think we'll make some huge um, strides in data review, collapsing the space. But there's still going to be design decisions that need to be made. And again, Sam touched on them. What data are you going to store? How long are you going to store it? Those will be, those will be very significant costs. And, um, and I agree with you. I think that we're really going to be looking at having more real-time data and more traceable data. So it, the decommoditizing the fisheries, I think, will be coming. So I think I think it's going to be I think it's going to be a bright new world. <laughs> oh, and one thing, yes, and Chris, I just wanted to touch on another thing that you said. You know, the first EM project we did in 2010 was with FMA, a small um, a group of small trawlers on the West Coast, and they came to us because we were the only ones using digital cameras at the time. They wanted high resolution. Um, images of bycatch because they were working with the University of Oregon to automate species ID. So I've heard for many years now how this is all going to get done next weekend in a hackathon. 
and i would caution people to not have their over expectations species of fish like rock fish we have twenty seven species in alaska this it's it becomes very subtle it's difficult for human observers and it's difficult for human reviewers and we're not going to get there tomorrow but again that gets to a practical question do we need to know it's a dusky rock fish or do we need to know it's in a rock fish grouping of say three of them and I think those are the very practical um, design features that need to be considered as we look at designing an EM program and keeping it practical. Well, I, I feel like I need to clarify this fish hackathon thing a couple <laughs> of times because the fish hackathon was actually something that the State Department Office of Global Partnership runs, and they, they had their third one this year. This year's global winner was just announced. They designed an app to predict Asian carp spawning in the Gulf of in the Great Lakes, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, you can get to you can get to where you need to go before the carp get there and head them off. So, but that is a there is a library of over 110 different projects, including fix, fish sizing algorithms, fish length algorithms. Uh, that's all open source and that's all publicly yeah. available for anybody to work into their EM systems. So, Sam, do you have a, a, a vision for EM yeah. and the future? I have, I have a bifurcated vision. One is domestically. Right. On the domestic side, I think that we are going to, right now, we've, we're ending, I think, the pilot phase where we are testing out a lot of these various things. We still have some testing to do, but we are actually transitioning into full scale. Uh, implementation of large-scale camera systems. We've had other kinds of electronic monitoring for a long time, mm -hmm. um, but you know we just started with the Atlantic fisheries. The Pacific fisheries are, are going into the full framework. Alaska is coming along soon. Hopefully, New England after that. Um, so you will see in five years some of our biggest fisheries um, fully utilizing this technology. We will see a lot more real-time data reporting. I think it'll make it. You know, at some point that cost curve is going to go down. So it will make these some of these cost barriers to increase monitoring go away. So we'll be able to monitor more, better, more accurate. I think all that's good. Uh, what that will mean to internationally, though, is we already in the United States use good monitoring as, uh, as part of our argument that other countries should replicate, should follow. There are not a lot of countries that have uh, substantial on the water monitoring capabilities like we do and use here. Our fishermen market their products with this against other countries that don't. Um, the more we can make it, the more we can implement it, the more we can make it cost effective, the better argument we can have globally that other countries should, should follow our lead and monitor our fisheries so that they can have accurate, sustainable fisheries as well. It'll benefit our fishermen, it'll benefit the resource. That's where I see us going. Maybe not in five years, but soon after that. I think we'll wrap this up with that. I'd just like to add my thanks to everybody here and, and just a little bit of a, a vision from, from my perspective. It's exciting to see what these new technologies are bringing to our ability to con conserve and manage our fisheries going forward and to accurately count and track our fisheries going forward. But I also hope that this new information we're bringing forward, this new data that can be turned into information that we bring forward, does develop a public facing side so that it's not only making things more efficient and effective for the fishermen who are harvesting these fish, but also providing an opportunity for anyone who wants to be involved in fisheries management to look at the data, to see what's coming out of the fishery, and to show up at a fishery management council meeting with the same information that any council member or anyone else in the process has access to and be able to fully participate in contributing to the foregoing management of America's fisheries. So I have that vision, which is that the data are better for fishermen and for managers, but also for all of us who care about stewarding a public resource five years from now. So thank you to all of our panelists. And I have to say a special thank you to KW for leading this conversation on EM, ER, VMS, HMS, uh -huh. all for the benefit of IUU with no BS. <laughs> that was pretty, pretty good. Um, so thank you all. That's a wrap for this day. Um, really appreciate your attentiveness, your engagement, your awesome questions. We are... Um, Expecting you all to be back bright and early tomorrow. We have some really exciting panels to close the symposium. 
um, aquaculture is on the schedule, Gulf restoration, local voices for a sustainable Arctic economy, and of course, our signature leadership roundtable. So um, for more details, check in your packets or on the online app, um, or ask any of the staff and trustees and other partners here for, for help. Um, until then, have a great evening, and thank you to all of you acronym kings and queens. <laughs>